All right, this is finite math, matrices, and Gauss-Jordan. This will help for uh, week two homework, and this will be dealing with matrices. I first want to remind you about the row operations in chapter 2.2 uh, of your textbook. And the row operations, there's three of them. We can interchange any two rows, so switch out row I for row J, replace those two with each other, just sort of flip them around. We can replace any row by a non-zero constant multiple of itself. Uh, it sounds a little scary. All we're saying is you can multiply a row by a constant number. Multiplying by zero doesn't really help us, so we don't do it. And finally, for number three, this is the most common one that we use. You can replace any row by the sum of that row and a constant multiple of any other row. When we write this in our notation, we're going to write row i plus a row j. Row i is going to be the one we change. Write the one you're going to change first. That way when you're looking through your steps at what you did, you know which one was getting changed at what time. Our goal with doing these row operations is to solve systems of linear equations. In particular, we want to solve our matrix, our augmented matrix, so that I have the identity matrix contained on the left side of the augmented part and on the right side I'm going to have numbers and those two numbers are going to set it up so that I know what X is equal to and I know what Y is equal to. That's my end goal here with this process. So let's take an example of this and deal with it. We're going to use row operations to solve 2X minus 3Y equals negative 8 and 4x plus y equals negative 2. The first thing to do is to put it into an augmented matrix. My augmented matrix is going to look like 2, negative 3, negative 8. Coming from 2, negative 3, and negative 8. On my second row, I'm going to have 4, 1, negative 2. Again, coming from 4, 1, and negative 2. It's not a 0 there. I'm just talking about the number in front of y, which is understood to be 1. Then I'm going to use these three row operations to eventually turn this part of the matrix and get it to look like 1, 0, 0, 1. The book makes a big deal about talking about pivot elements and all sorts of wonderful steps you can take but you don't really have to make the process as complicated as that. Just take things a step at a time, getting stuff that you want. The first thing I'm going to do, and in general, while it says pivots, it says all these crazy things, your goal is to move top to bottom, left to right, getting each of these three, four goals a piece at a time. So when I look over here, I see this 2, I'd like this 2 to be a 1, and the way I'm going to do that using my row operations, well, interchanging rows isn't going to work, so instead I'm going to replace any row by a non-zero constant multiple of itself, and that non-zero constant multiple of itself that I'm going to do is going to be I'm going to take 1 half times row 1, because if I multiply 2 times 1 half, that'll get me the 1 I'm after. So let's make that replacement. The second row isn't going to change, so I'm just going to copy it down just as it is right now. Once you get more comfortable with the process, feel free to change more than one row at a time if that's helpful to you, but right now I just want to take it one step at a time. Multiplying the top row by one half, I get one half times two, and that gives me one. I get one half times negative three, that gives me negative three halves. And lastly, I get 1 half times negative 8. And that's going to give me negative 4. I've got one of my goals. In fact, it almost looks like I have a second goal here. But let's not get too much ahead of ourselves. I've got one of my goals. And that's good enough for me at the moment. Next, I'd like to get another of my goals. I'd like to get a zero down there in the bottom left spot. Again, I'm going to use these row operations, and I'm going to use those to get myself a zero here. I don't want my top row to change, so it's not going to change. I do want to change my bottom row, so I'm going to do something to row two. In particular, 
I'm going to subtract 4 times row 1. Remember, this is one of the three row operations I can do. In particular, it's the third one, which I said is the most common. Messing with rows by adding multiples of other rows to them. Because row 2 is the one that's changing, row 1 isn't going to change at all. So it's going to stay 1, minus 3 halves, and negative 4. That's not going to change at all. But the bottom row is going to change. If I take 4 from the bottom row, and then subtract 4 times the top row, I'm going to get 0. Let me make this into a bit of an equation over here. Row 2 minus 4 row 1. What's really happening is I'm saying, well, for row 2 I'm taking 4, and for row 1 I'm taking 1, and this equation says I subtract 4 times that. This gives me 4 minus 4, it equals 0. For this next spot here in row 2, well, I'm taking the 1 for row 2. For row 1, I'm going to take this negative 3 halves. And the equation pattern I'm plugging it into says I subtract 4 from it. This gives me 1 minus 6. And minus minus is going to give me a plus, because here's a minus and here's a minus. And so this is going to leave me with 7. So the answer I stick in this spot is 7. I'm just plugging into this equation, row 2 minus 4, row 1. That's all that's happening here. Lastly, I take negative 2, and I subtract 4 times negative 4 from it. And that's going to leave me with 14. This is good. Remember my goal? My goal is to get a 1 here and a 0 here, and that means I'm halfway done. Next, I look at what I'm after. One of the things I'd like is I'd like a 1 to be here. With my row operations possible, one of the things I can do is replace any row with a constant multiple of itself. If I take 1 7th times row 2, it's going to get me something good. Again, the top row is not going to change. 1, negative 3 halves, and negative 4. No reason to do anything there. But I take 1 7th times 0, and that gives me 0. I take 1 7th times 7, and that gives me 1. And I take 1 7th times 14, and that gives me 2. At this point, my bottom row, row 2, is perfectly fine. It's exactly in the format I want it to be. It's got a 0, 1 here. And on the other side, the augmented part, it's got some constant number. In this case, that number is 2. But I'm not quite done yet. I need to do one last thing with my rows. I need to turn this guy here into a 0. To make that, I'm going to pick one last set of row operations to do. I'm going to use the most common row operation. Row 1 needs to change, so I write it first. And what I need to do is turn negative 3 halves into 0. So what? Minus 3 halves equals 0. Well, 3 halves does. It's row 2 there. Not quite looking like a row 2, so let's rewrite that. So row 1 plus 3 halves row 2 is going to give me what I want. Row 1 is written first, which means row 2 is not going to change. And let's see what happens. Again, I'm going to plug into this almost like it's an algebraic equation just to show what's going on. Eventually you're going to get comfortable enough you practically do this in your head. For row 1 I take the number 1 plus 3 halves and for row 2 I take the number 0. This gives me 1 plus 0 which just equals 1. Nothing big has changed. Adding 0 to things doesn't make any difference. But then for row 1 I take negative 3 halves plus 3 halves from here, times my row 2 number, and my row 2 number there is 1. This gives me negative 3 halves plus 3 halves, which equals 0. This was what I wanted to have there. Lastly, I take this negative 4, and I add plus 3 halves times row 2. And that's going to leave me negative 1. I've solved my matrix into my goal form. Now I just have to interpret what that means. What I've got with this matrix here, let's take it over here and give ourselves some space, 
So I've got 1, 0, 0, 1, negative 1, 2. And what this tells me is that x equals negative 1 and y equals negative two, is equals positive 2. That tells me that my solution is this, negative 1, 2. If we'd use the addition method, or if we'd use the graphing method, or even if we'd use the substitution method, on this original set of equations here, we would have gotten this answer all the same. Gauss-Jordan elimination is a way to use matrices to get this solution. And at the moment, it might not seem like it's any faster than any of the other methods we have for solving linear equations. But it's going to be faster when we handle something more complicated, when we handle something that's bigger than just x's and y's. We have x, y's, and z's, or a whole bunch of things. This is going to make us have a lot faster thing. So here's our answer, minus 1, 2.